from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the listening ears of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this week I've been reading a really intriguing book called Radical Spirit by Joan Chittister. I don't know about you, but when I hear the word radical, It throws me back to distant memories of my childhood, when radicals protested, where people that were called hippies sat in as a demonstration, as a sign of being outside the establishment, objecting to money and power and decisions being made by a few on behalf of the many. There's a positive nostalgia about that time now, but back then, it was scary. For a lot of people. Life as people understood it was being challenged. Back then, it felt like the establishment was on its last legs. So what happened? Those radicals somehow grew into being today's establishment, which is still centered on making money and having power and centered on individual goals. Not so radical, after all. Maybe what we need today is more than that image of anti-establishment that only goes so deep. Maybe what we need is a radical spirit. A radical spirit who will change us and challenge us so that the fire and the wind that are trying to break in can set us free. Once upon a time, the ancients say, a disciple traveled far and wide to find a spiritual master who could lead him to the fullness of the spiritual life. What is it you seek? The Holy One asked him. Master, the young seeker replied, how can I ever be emancipated? The master answered, you must ask yourself who it is who has put you in bondage. That's the first step recognizing that we, many of us, are in a bondage of our own making. For many of us, the bondage exists in our illusion that the world revolves around us, that if we only do X, Y, and Z, we can control the outcomes of our lives. We can control our world and make it the way we think it will be best. We'll be perfectly happy. We'll have everything we need and a little more. We'll never be bothered by a call from the school, or a pink slip at work, or a diagnosis from the doctor. And if those things that we don't want to happen do happen, we wonder if only we'd be better, if we'd only been a little more perfect, could we have stopped the problems from coming? What has us in bondage? Is it perfectionism? Is it fear, fear of upsetting our financial security? Is it what the world will think if they find out? Have we been divining ourselves by our own mistakes to the point that we can't see a way out? Have we been defining ourselves by our own successes to the point that we can't see that we aren't in this alone? We grow blind to what we put in charge of our lives. When we put ourselves, our issues, and our needs squarely in the center of who we are, we try to silence the voices in us that say that the world isn't all about us, that we can't have what isn't ours, that we do need to care for other people, that we do need to care for God's creation, that what happens to you matters to me. We try to silence the needs of our spiritual center, 
The spiritual whole at our core is our consciousness of the presence of God in our lives. The things we try to fill that hole with leave us bound. We begin to be set free when we realize that we are not our only agenda. Giving ourselves to God, giving our lives to something larger than us, frees us from those chains. Albert Einstein once said, no problem can be solved by the same consciousness that caused it. When we choose to believe that our life is within our control and bring our same brain and spirit to any problems we encounter, we miss the chance to look through the lens of the Spirit of God, who is waiting to dream God's dreams through us and meet us in the empty places of our souls, not because we've earned that, but because that's how God made us in the first place, with the free gift of God's presence ready to move with us into the world, not grounded in us, but grounded in God, which is a much stronger foundation. God's power and God's strength, they run so much deeper than we can fathom until we open ourselves up to experience them. When we cannot imagine how to go on, it is the Spirit of God that fills us up for the journey. Life is not all about us, and that is wonderful news. There is good greater than we can imagine. Somebody once said, the spirit is something you trust in, not something you can easily explain. In fact, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives in ways that are often disruptive to the carefully constructed world we have tried to believe in, the one where we are God and all will go according to our plan, And though the still small voice of the Spirit is often hard to hear, it's also not the only way the Spirit speaks. Sometimes the Spirit is loud and disruptive, telling us we're on the wrong track and it's time to recognize God doesn't want to stay safely, quietly in the box we've reserved for God. The one that doesn't actually interfere with anything else we have going on. The box that doesn't challenge us when we have given too much of ourselves for too little, when we have made our lives about the least they can be instead of the most. Radical spirituality is opening ourselves up to the God who's willing to hear us in our own language and guide us along the way. In Chitterson's words, we can live our lives with a relaxed grasp doing what needs doing, and trusting the end to God, deciding to let God be God in our lives. When has the Spirit disrupted your peace? I know families who have thought that they were on their way to retirement, who were making new decisions with their lives, when suddenly their empty nest wasn't empty anymore because there's another child in need whose parents are no longer alive, who need somebody to step into the gap, and there they are. They have been disrupted by the Spirit calling out to them, connecting them with someone new. How has the Spirit disrupted your life? The song that we're about to sing, Here I Am, Lord, always brings back memories of the first time I heard it, which was when I was interviewing for a job in Omaha, Nebraska. There was another church in Maryland. I liked that one a lot. It was close to friends of mine. I knew the area. But when I went to Omaha, I had the sense that the Spirit was disrupting my plan. And so I sat in worship that Sunday without anyone really knowing who I was, And they sang this song. And I looked up at the senior pastor, smiling like this was sort of a dirty trick to pick a song like this on a day like this. And he told me later, it was the music director. And he didn't know anybody was going to be here. And I didn't know the song. The spirit disrupted my plan. And it was the best thing that could have happened. This morning, we confirm three young people who have decided to make for themselves the promises made for them at their baptism. 
This is a moment of making the choice to say yes to the Spirit, leading to them to a path, a journey with the love of God. This is a moment of saying yes to the church and who it tries to be in this broken world, a place that points past the institution to the radical spirituality we learn from the one who came to walk with us in life, in death, and everything in between, to say yes to hope and no to fear, and ultimately say yes to following Jesus. This morning, As we hear them answer the questions, we have a chance once again to open ourselves up to saying yes to Jesus, to saying yes to the Holy Spirit coming into our lives, the Holy Spirit who is ready to turn our worlds inside out and right side up. May we learn again to follow the love of Christ out into the world. In Jesus' name, amen.